Hello, everyone. Welcome to another International Relations Capsule for the Shankar IAS Academy. Today, the topic of our discussion is the recent Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which held its 22nd summit meeting in Uzbekistan in Samarkand. Eight countries participated in it, but more than the discussions on the agenda of the organization itself, the meeting became significant for various other reasons. The summit had not met for three years because of the pandemic, and many things had happened between within these three years. So the cooperation summit, cooperation organization, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, was meeting after a long time, and by then, many changes had taken place. The most important thing was the Ukraine war, which uh, brought Russia, which is a leading member of the organization, to the docks because the war was continuing and nobody in the world is happy for this to continue except Russia and Ukraine, because both sides uh, hoping, are hoping that they will win the war. But the rest of the world is very concerned. And therefore, the meeting in uh, Uzbekistan, in Samarkand, uh, became a place for discussion of this matter in an indirect manner, because the war itself was not on the agenda of the conference. And the conference dealt with the usual things that they speak about, security in the region, terrorism, economic development, trade, etc. So there was a communique issued, but the communique reflected the world before the pandemic, because there were the consensus positions of these countries before the pandemic and before the Ukraine war. So the real world of the conference depended on the other things that happened there. The interesting thing was Russia, China, and India were represented at the highest level. In fact, President Xi Jinping had gone out for the first time from his country after the pandemic erupted. So it was a very significant thing that he went to the summit in uh, Samarkand. Uh, of course, President Putin was there, and uh, India's presence was also uh, in question because of the situation between India and China being so bad, and whether Indian Prime Minister would go there in order to uh, meet or talk to President Xi Jinping. Uh, but one important thing that happened was just before the summit, there was a thaw in the relationship between India and China because of the withdrawal of Chinese troops uh, from one more sector in Ladakh. So many people felt that China agreed to this uh, withdrawal or disengagement uh, in order to persuade or encourage Prime Minister Modi to go to Samarkand. And therefore, there was speculation that it may also happen that there might be a meeting between the Prime Minister of India and the President of China. If a meeting had taken place, uh, many, thing, many things could have happened. It could have improved our relations with China, um, or it may have worsened because both the countries would have stood by the position that they hold today. So we do not know whether the meeting did not take place because neither China nor India asked for a meeting, because bilateral meetings are special, that's not part of the conference. But it's normal, normal that countries, even when they have differences, they do hold bilateral meetings on such occasions. And therefore, there was speculation that President Xi Jinping will meet Prime Minister Narendra Modi. But on the first day itself, since Mr. Narendra Modi arrived rather late to the meeting, there was not even opportunities for photos to be taken between them because 
Mr. Modi was not there on the first day. And people say it was done on purpose. So the next uh, two days, of course, such a meeting did not take place. And that was an important development that even though India and China were present at the same place, the leaders did not meet. So obviously, the reason is that neither side is happy with the other. Even though they disengaged in this new sector, there was no solution to the problem. And there has also been criticism inside India that we compromised on this particular situation because we seem to have, according to some reports, we seem to have made these buffer zones in territories held by India earlier. This has not been confirmed or denied by the government of India. But there is criticism that we made some undue concessions to the Chinese on this occasion. So, but whatever it is, this disengagement, since it was not a de-escalation, it was only a movement of troops backwards, but many things remained as it is. So it was not considered progress enough for our prime minister to ask for a meeting. And naturally the president also did not ask for it. And so this non-meeting was one of the most important events of the summit. So that means within the summit, two major countries are not on talking terms with each other. The second most important thing that happened was a bilateral meeting between Prime Minister of India and President Vladimir Putin. This was very significant because by till now, India was being uh, considered on the side of Russia in the Ukraine war because of our abstentions in the United Nations Security Council. But on the last occasion, where there was a vote as to whether Zelensky uh, should, should appear before the Security Council online, we voted in favor of that, which was considered uh, against Russia, because Russia had proposed that he should come personally or not come to the Security Council. So for the first time on an issue relating to Ukraine war, India voted against what Russia had proposed and not abstained. So this seemed to have been a little indication that uh, we are um, slightly moving towards a more central position than what it appeared to be. But in, it has always been our position that we stand for peace, we stand for dialogue, we stand for democracy, and this is not the time for war. But this was put to President Putin by Mr. Narendra Modi himself in front of the cameras. This was very significant because in front of the cameras, the Prime Minister said to President Putin that this is not the time for war. And he said that this is a time that we should encourage democracy, encourage negotiations, encourage diplomatic dialogue. Of course, Mr. Putin responded to it by saying that he understood India's concerns and he even mentioned China's concerns on the war. And he said, well, we will try and end the war as far as possible because you all feel that uh, this is causing problems to the world. But he immediately uh, followed it by saying that the responsibility of continuing the war is that of Ukraine and its friends. And he also said that I'm not in a hurry to end these operations. So he did not really respond uh, favorably to India's uh, comment. But at the same time, uh, he, he did say that he will try and resolve these issues provided they are the cooperation from the uh, other side, not the Ukraine and others. So this particular conversation between uh, Prime Minister Modi and uh, President Putin in public created some waves internationally that India is, uh, has administered a rebuke. This is what the Western newspaper said, a rebuke to Putin. And this was significant, but it has been clarified in the press and other commentaries which have appeared that it was not such a rebuke. It was simply a matter of telling him our views. And uh, we indicated uh, the kind of problems that the world is going to face if the war continues. And therefore, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization as a whole must encourage dialogue. 
And, but uh, it was very clear that in this group of eight countries, India was the only country which openly spoke about this in a rather plain manner. So what does it indicate? It seems to indicate uh, that the new world order is emerging. You know, we have all been talking about the old order have been has been dis has disappeared and a new order is not yet born. But it, has, it was became clear in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization that the future may well be uh, a cold war between democratic countries on the one hand and autocratic countries on the other. So in this group of eight, there was no other democracy other than India. So it, the responsibility fell upon India to express the feelings of the democratic world or the conscience of the world. So my interpretation is that India has served notice on the world that in the emerging war world, world order, in which perhaps the democracies will be on the one side and autocracies on the other, India has to be naturally on the side of democracy. And that signal has been given. And I feel it was a right decision to do so because we were clubbed with China and Russia in this particular issue of the war in Ukraine. So this was also a very significant event at the meeting. The third event at the meeting was that the, another non-meeting, that is a non-meeting between Indian Prime Minister and the Pakistan's Prime Minister, who is new. Shabazz Sharif is a new Prime Minister. They have not met. From the Pakistan side, there has been expression of wanting to meet, but obviously they did not seem to have asked for a meeting with Prime Minister. And both sides again were waiting for the other to um, take the initiative. Uh, but uh, in the case of Pakistan, it was not new because India had already said repeatedly uh, that uh, India would have nothing to do with the Pakistan government, whoever comes to power, as long as Pakistan does not abandon terrorism. So that was a clear position of policy. And uh, therefore, whether it was a new prime minister or old prime minister in Pakistan, it did not matter. Pakistan's policies do not change with prime ministers. It is the army which takes these decisions. And it was right that Prime Minister Modi decided not to meet him. So this must have been a tough uh, situation for three of them to avoid each other <laughs> in uh, Tashkent. Normally, these summits provide opportunities uh, for senior leaders to talk and resolve issues. But the new, old, new world order does not seem to allow that. And therefore, this is another indication about the uh, conference itself. So these are the these were the main features which attracted world attention. But if you look at the conference itself and its agenda and so on, much of it was the old ones. Uh, the countries that attended were Russia, China, then Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan, and uh, India and Pakistan. So Russia and China, then the former Soviet republics, three of them. India and Pakistan. And it was agreed that Iran will also join the SCO at the next meeting. And it was also agreed that India would take on the chairmanship of SCO from now on. And in 2023, the summit will be held in India. Of course, that presents its own complications because the first time that India is going to host such a meeting and the question will arise for Pakistan and China whether they will attend that if our difficulties with these two countries, countries continue till the next year. So SEO's next meeting itself is in doubt uh, because Pakistan is unlikely to attend and China may not attend, but China and Russia indicated at this meeting that they would support India's chairmanship of SEO. It may have been just a formality, but they did say that they will extend all support to India to hold the summit because it is in, inter in, in their interest that this meeting should be held. And Pakistan did not make it very clear whether 
it will attend or not, but uh, they left it in vague as to whether Prime Minister Sharif will attend the meeting in India or not. Uh, another uh, development was that there are several observers, dialogue partners, and special case joint. So this is what happens when a, a grouping becomes important. Many people want to be in it. If they cannot be in it as members, they like to join as observers, dialogue partners, and special guests. So it is growing uh, from a, basically a Central Asian grouping. It has now become a Eurasian greater duration partnership. So, and they are thinking in terms of the SEO growing into other regions, other groups, like SEO region meetings, then Eurasian Economic Union, ASEAN, etc. So to these regional groups, SEO is supposed to be uh, joining and uh, having more uh, discussions. So uh, the bilateral meeting, I just mentioned that uh, bilateral meetings did not take place, uh, but many observers pointed out that this was a, a major uh, meeting uh, because if you look at statistics, it is 40% of the world population, 30% of world GDP, 22% of uh, the planet's land. So this grouping is really becoming a major grouping, but ideologically, it uh, seems to be, except for India, a group of autocracies. So there's also a plan for further expansion. Iran will be a ninth member of the summit when the summit is held in India. And uh, there is uh, expansion towards West Asia and South Asia also. So in fact, an organization becomes stronger with more numbers but it can also become weaker with more numbers. What happened to the non-aligned movement, we all know. If everybody becomes non-aligned, then the strength of the non-aligned movement only decreases. Because if it is not a select membership, anybody can join a particular group, then the group gets diluted rather than concentrated. So that may happen in the case of SEO, and many may join the SEO uh, simply to uh, make it irrelevant as a regional organization that we have to see. Uh, but the agenda, of course, included terrorism, separatism, extremism. And uh, in the summit document, which was issued, none of these uh, new issues, Iran war, of course, the pandemic figures, but the, the war in uh, between Russia and Ukraine does not figure. So Central Asia is the core of this. And there is also there was also reports that Afghanistan may also be permitted uh, to join, in spite of the fact that uh, many countries have not recognized Afghanistan. Um, but in the document, there was a reference to speedy settlement of the situation in Afghanistan. It doesn't say anything about uh, uh, the, the terrorist group being in power, other countries not having uh, recognized it, but a very general statement that the settlement of the situation in Afghanistan was uh, essential. Um, then uh, India uh, thought that it was uh, prudent for it to uh, keep away from ideas like the BRI, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, because Belt and Road Initiative, all the other countries in SEO are members of it. And there was some positive reference to that, but we kept out of it. And India has to make the group more effective. And um, so we have this uh, responsibility in the next year uh, to be more, to make SEO more effective. And uh, the challenge is, is very much there. And uh, several geopolitical dimensions are emerging. India has now taken a position in the Ukraine war, which is different from before. And so SEO has become more complex after this. Uh, for example, the landlocked Central Asian countries and uh, Russia and China have been competing for influence there. Then, then Central Asian states, those who are the former Soviet socialist republics, are seeking enhanced presence 
of India in this region. It's a balance against uh, China and Russia. So India is we have a lot of uh, interest in uh, Central Asia because, as you know, they have a lot of hydrocarbon and other opportunities for economic development. And therefore, India's enhanced presence is welcome, and that is something which we. And of course, uh, there is general objection to religious extremism and terrorism. Uh, so. Afghanistan may be included. Some people say Saudi Arabia will come along. And Turkey was actually present as a guest and Qatar. So next time we may see by the time the conference is held in India, uh, there could be more people. So, but, uh, but the whole atmosphere was, as I said earlier, was determined by various uh, issues which has emerged since the last summit. First, of course, is the Russian intervention in Ukraine, about which everybody is restless and unhappy. But of course, they could not take a position, except for India. Then the Ladakh situation was of great concern, though there has been some disengagement, but there is no de-escalation of the conflict. And uh, there is criticism that uh, India may have conceded some land to China, which will have to be again discussed. Then U.S. relations with China and Russia deteriorated in this period. The U.S. Is, uh, is more worried about Russia now. And uh, on top of it, China and Russia have joined together. And, um, and that has complicated matters. So by the time the conference in India takes place, we do not know in which direction U.S. relations uh, uh, will go. So, US and uh, Europe also are very important if this organization has to be strengthened. But in the present conflict, if the uh, war does not end, this will be a, a, a kind of uh, uh, crisis in the ACO. Um, in the aggression against India, did not figure, nobody raised it. So what the, and even in Pakistan, the only uh, uh, demand that he made from Pakistan was that there should be, we should give greater access to each other, particularly for India to sub send supplies to Afghanistan. Pakistan is not allowing access through Pakistan. And therefore that was an issue which uh, he, he raised and um, but since there was uh, no meeting between China and, uh, and India, uh, there was no time for to discussion. But um, uh, interestingly, Prime Minister Modi met Erdogan, the uh, Prime Minister of uh, Turkey, which was a surprise. Um, but um, uh, the, to balance the uh, conversation on, on the Ukraine war, President Modi tweeted, after the summit, after his meeting with uh, President Putin, that his meeting was wonderful. That's the word he used in his uh, tweet. So this is to probably balance the what he said about the Ukraine war. And um, so, but apparently, a lot of bilateral cooperation agreements were reached. The question of India receiving oil supplies from Russia, which is a controversial matter in Europe, uh, but at the same time, uh, it is going strongly and we are getting advantage. And then trade, energy, defense and other areas, bilateral cooperation will proceed. So that is the other uh, development that in bilateral agreements and bilateral relations, India and Russia had a fruitful meeting. So this is the sum of the meeting in uh, Tashkent. Uh, the conference itself was just a uh, routine, routine matters. But because of the circumstances which had developed between the last meeting and this one, there were so much of, uh, I should say, ripples of political and geopolitical ripples at the meeting, which I mentioned. So it remains to be seen what happens when SEO meets next year in India. This is going to be a a major 
change in the situation because India will be hosting it. And India will have to deal with all these issues and bring about some kind of progress for the future. Thank you very much. I have been recommending, I don't know if you saw my article in the Hindu, but, uh, I am advocating that we should focus on bilateral relations now. Because uh, multilaterally, nobody is willing to commit anything. Everybody is just keeping their position open. Because the, the world order, the new world order is not clear yet. And therefore, my suggestion is that we need to focus on our bilateral relations that when a multipolar world emerges, we must have some steady and fast friends. And that we cannot get through multilateral activities. That's my point of view. And also you may have seen Suhasini Haider's article where she talked about all alignment. India is aligning itself with all the countries in the world. So, and that also, I suppose, she means bilateral, not multilateral. So I think it will be good and not because uh, bilateralism is preferable to multilateralism. I know you, you know, my, I spent all my life in multilateral diplomacy and I have great faith in that. But multilateral diplomacy demands an atmosphere of compromise and uh, consideration. If it is not there, multilateral diplomacy doesn't succeed. And that is why UN is ineffective uh, because there is no cooperation, there is no give and take. No, but they're now going to expand. As of now, if Russia and China had different views, then they had a balance. But since, so therefore, the composition is very interesting. Russia, China, okay, one carrier. Then Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. What are, who are they? They are the ones who are seeking independence from Russia. In the sense that they want to have cooperation. At the same time, they want to assert their independence. So they were rather quiet. But it was clear that they were there in order to assert their independence. India is there because we are interested in Central Asia. All these complications we had not anticipated. So we joined because we have scope to deal with Central Asia in a collective group. That's what we thought. And the Pakistan went there only because India went there. <laughs> so, but now the next one will be Iran. Iran also will be among the non-democratic uh, participant. So India being the only democratic participant in the SEO may create some problems for us because one or two meetings, ministerial meetings of SEO which were held, they issued a separate declaration excluding India because India and they could not agree on the same kind of language. So uh, here also there was no, no statement on Ukraine, etc. In, uh, in, the, in the common meeting. So SEO is in transition. And which direction it will go if the Middle Eastern countries, etc., join in, join in, there may be a further balance in that. And if not, it may become a block as against democratic countries. And that is the risk involved. But you cannot say anything about it till we come to the uh, time of our meeting in India. No, no, this is how it is being interpreted. When I discussed it, I did not say that. What I said was that this is a likely to be an indication, just like the last vote in the Security Council, when we did not abstain. We were blindly abstaining. And uh, many times, our ambassador was being asked by other countries, you know, you vote together with China on everything, as far as Ukraine is concerned. Why is it so? Or why is, how is Indian position different from the Chinese position? So I think we were waiting for an opportunity to show that we are not always voting together. And so we supported uh, the appearance of Zelensky in, in the Security Council online. That is what Russia had objected. So that actually had sent some ripples around the UN that India is shifting. And uh, so this openly uh, telling him that this is not the time for war, which is a rather firm statement. It is not just, he was not just seeking uh, dialogue, etc., as you were saying earlier. And then uh, Putin's reaction was also that uh, you have been repeatedly saying what your difficulties. 
So he knows that. He knows that India has been saying this. And uh, so he acknowledged it, acknowledged it, but he did take any responsibility to end the war. He said that this is not my problem. Those people are not cooperating. And then he went on to say, I'm in no hurry to resolve it, as long as they don't want to resolve it. So his position has not cha changed. But many in the Western press are saying that India rebuked Russia. It's not so, but there is a truth of it. And what I have said is that is a good sign that we have to indicate that when there is a new world order between democracy and uh, uh, autocracies, India has to be on the right side of history. That's my point. Nothing has changed. We respected the Queen and we, of course, respect, respect Charles III also. There won't be any difference in India. UK relations. In any case, the crown does not make policies. So the relations with the crown is kind of sentimental, kind of formal, kind of ceremonial. And that relationship will continue. Of course, the style of the king will be different from that of the great queen. Uh, but as they say, according to the UK constitution, the king can do no wrong because he has no authority to do anything. So he can only support the government. And therefore, I don't expect any big. Uh, Big change, but I noticed that within India there are some rumors about you know come, why should we be in the Commonwealth? Why should we be recognizing the queen of the head of the Commonwealth? There I may agree because the Commonwealth doesn't do anything much. They just repeat the same agenda items of the of the UN and repeat the same statements. So, you know, Commonwealth does not have it. Particularly now after the decolonization process is over. The colonization process, Commonwealth had a major, and the last one was, one was in 1979, uh, Zimbabwe. So after that, there is no decolonization issue. And one issue that they have been discussing is the problems of small and island, small countries and island states. And so, on. But that they can take care of themselves in the UN. So withdrawing from the Commonwealth or abolishing the Commonwealth may not be a bad idea. But uh, the respect for the king and uh, uh, UK monarchy will continue in India. In some other, some other countries, they are trying to remove the status of head of state of the queen or the king. And uh, Australia, they tried, and the referendum went in favor of the queen. So that could not be pursued. So that is the that's the situation. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>